it's a profound topic that we're going to share with you today. It's a, a topic that doesn't get much press and is not talked about that much. In many ways, it's a part of the complicating factor. When we think of things like disease and when we think about uh, human suffering, the word aflatoxin doesn't usually come to the conversation. I should say, uh, company me today are a, a group of incredibly distinguished individuals. I'll let them introduce themselves. Kitty uh, Cardwell, who I've known for a very long time uh, through her efforts on aflatoxin uh, at the U.S. Department of Agriculture, Agricultural Research Service. Uh, John Lamb, who I, I've known of, uh, working on international issues uh, for a long time from APT, and Barbara Stinson from Meridian Institute, who I interface with. with it seems like I, I go in and out with Meridian all the time, and uh, we'll describe some of her activities. What we'd like to do today is raise the issue in a very, very fundamental way, because when we talk about the future of food, uh, normally we talk about calories, you know. How much do you need? And what, we won't even get into nutrition at this moment. But there's a number of people every day who face a toxic threat to their lives, and that's the story of aflatoxin. So you'll hear three perspectives of it today. Uh, most people have never seen it. Uh, because we don't normally eat aflatoxin-laden food, but I can tell you if you go to Africa or India, you will eat aflatoxin-laden food. It invades as many as 40 different crops, maybe more, that we have measured. Next slide, please. These are a few of them. Obviously, many of these are very important to Mars Incorporated. Uh, cacao, peanuts, uh, and rice uh, for our core businesses. But these are some of the things that people want to eat every day. They want to eat groundnuts. They want to eat cassava as their starch material. They want to eat millet, finger millet in particular. And they want to eat rice. And they want to eat spices. And they want to eat tree nuts. And these are all impacted by that. More than 40. Next, please. Um, pre prevalence. Uh, I think the... The notion of 4.5 billion people. When you say these numbers and you talk about 4.5 billion people out of the population, it's, it certainly should be framed in the word crisis. Is it a crisis of science? Is it a crisis of consciousness? Which crisis is it? But it's a humanitarian crisis that 4.5 billion people are affected by aflatoxin annually. If you were to add up many of the diseases in the world that have hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars, billions of dollars of funding, they wouldn't add up to this total of people impacted. And yet this is probably one of the most underfunded issues in human health and well-being. Next slide, please. So impact on health, it, it's, it's a tragedy. This is not a disease that is casual. This is not a disease that you can discount because you don't know about it. These are tragic consequences that affect many, many people. In Nigeria, it's the largest cause of liver cancer. There's been debate whether it's suspected to be a major contributor to stunting. There really is no debate. The science is really very, very empirical. And recently, there was some more papers published that make it even more emphatic. Disrupts uptake of vitamins A, D, iron, and selenium, all critical, especially for pregnant mothers and young women before they're even pregnant. Next slide, please. So we regulate it. We really regulate it well. 20 parts per billion in food. It's different in animal feed. But 20 parts per billion. It's hard to imagine what 20 parts per billion is. You know, it's hard to imagine a billion and then you go 100 million, and then a million, and then 100,000, and then 1,000, and then 100, and then 20 parts per billion. So I have a couple examples which illustrate what 20 parts per billion actually is. Next slide, please. So one part per billion is one part per grain substrate, 10 to the minus ninth, just to give you the math, one nanogram 
per gram. And the next slide really puts it in perspective. It's, one, it's 20 seconds in 32 years. That's how infinitesimally small it is. Usain Bolt runs the 200 meter, I think, in about 20 seconds, maybe 19 something, but it's close enough rounded up. So every time he runs that little 20 second dash, that's what the, the call is in 32 years. It's incomprehensible. It's so minute. We find material that comes to our factory gate, not inside our factory, that has aflatoxin loads of 50 to 70,000 parts per billion. And then we do something which is good for our business. We reject it, right? Because we don't want it in our supply chain. But do you think it goes to the dump? It either goes back into the human food system because the driver goes down the road with this truck full of food, or it goes into the animal feed sector. So there's this issue, by doing good we actually do bad, which is a contradiction to a principled company like Mars, which is why we're having this conversation today. We want to bring forward, with a group of experts, the call to really take this on the way we've taken on many, many other things in society. So it's not just in the plant, it's in the soil. It's not just in the plant, it's in storage. So we need to have a series of solutions. Sometimes we only have to solve one part of a problem, and that's sufficient for an entire supply chain. In this case, we have to f figure out the soil issues, we have to figure out the plant issues, and we have to figure out the storage issues. Very few things impact us the way this particular mycotoxin, aflatoxin, ochratoxin impacts companies around the world. 4.5 billion people are impacted every year. I just want you to keep remembering that. 4.5 billion people. 20 parts per billion is a recall in the United States. Thank you, Howard. Next slide, please. So I am Kitty Cardwell. I'm with the National Institute of Food and Agriculture, not ARS. But I am with the USDA. Were you at ARS before? No. Oh, okay. <laughs> That's okay. It's all right. But, but the like reason you. I'm here is it started 20 years ago. I think I actually sort of opened a can of worms about aflatoxin. I was a research scientist in Nigeria at ITA, one of the uh, CG centers. And I was looking at corn and because I was a plant pathologist, I was looking at the fungi in the corn and I was finding a lot of aspergillus, which is the fungus that has this toxin. So I started measuring the toxin and I was finding 500 parts per billion averages, which he just told you 20 parts per billion is what is allowed. 500 parts per billion were average in some of the village stores. And so I was quite concerned about that. It's known to cause liver cancer, which is why we regulate it. We regulate the heck out of it. Our, our population in the United States, we don't even know about aflatoxin. Aflatoxin exists here too. It's in corn, it's in cotton, it's in a lot of things. But our regulatory system is so strict and so effective that it doesn't get into our food. We do not, we are not exposed to aflatoxin. We don't have it in our blood. You don't see stunting. Liver cancer is a small, uh, a, a very low occurrence here compa by comparison. But in the, in the developed world, we, we enforce it. But in Africa and Asia and Latin America, it isn't enforced. So what does that mean? So can I have, oh, I have this slide already. So how big is this problem? As I said, it's in three continents that we know of. It's almost anywhere where you find stunting, you're gonna find aflatoxin. In Africa and Asia so far, the blood sampling that we've done, 85 to 100% of the blood samples have aflatoxin in them. Children, as they're weaned, 100% of them in some countries in Africa have aflatoxin in the blood. And here's the deal, it's cumulative. So if you eat maize every day, you get more and more blood toxin as you go. Well, in our studies, people were eating maize seven times a week, seven days a week. They were eating it every day. It's the staple food, they're weaning their children onto maize that isn't contaminated with aflatoxin. 30 to 50% of the staple foods have above 20 parts per billion of aflatoxin in many countries in Africa. 
You're talking about a food security issue. You're talking about food waste problems. This is a big problem. And the governments there don't really want to talk about it. They don't want us to tell the population, and who can blame them? It's their staple food. It's what, it's what they eat every day. So what happens when there's no enforcement of aflatoxin? What it does is it causes illness and death. Catastrophic liver failure occurs every couple of years, 2004, 2008, 2011 in Kenya. People die outright from eating too much. It, they get into the 100 parts per million, 1,000 parts per billion. And, that, and it causes such destruction to the liver that they die outright of, of acute hepatic failure. It also kills the dogs, by the way, in the village. So you can almost always tell when it's aflatoxin because the dogs are dead too. Um, and it causes chronic liver toxicity throughout the life of the, of the individual, even if they don't die outright. And it causes liver cancer. So a lot of the countries of the world that have chronic exposure to aflatoxin, liver cancer is one of the top killers, particularly of men. It also is known to be very immune suppressive in sensitive animals, particularly sensitive weaning animals. Well, I believe that humans are sensitive animals to aflatoxin. And when, we, when our children are exposed to aflatoxin, they are very sensitive to it. It's immune suppressive. It causes a lifelong burden of disease on those individuals. It also is known to cause poor birth outcomes. In other words, around, around birth, perinatal mortality, uh, perinatal uh, weight loss, and impaired childhood development. Next slide, please. So how do we know that it's causing impaired childhood development? So what is the relationship to aflatoxin in the first 1,000 days of life? Studies have shown that mothers with higher blood aflatoxin level have smaller children. Those mothers who also tend to have smaller body mass indexes also are going to give smaller, uh, uh, birth to smaller children. The poor birth outcomes that I mentioned are lower birth weights and perinatal problems. But the big impact, I think, is as the children are being weaned from mother's milk in, onto complementary foods, they start faltering. The growth faltering begins almost immediately as the blood toxin starts to go up. So I'm going to show these two, two uh, graphs on the, on the right side of the slide there show this is actual data. This was published in the International Journal of Epide Epidemiology. This is the paper that I say opened the can of worms. We weren't looking for this. It, it was one of those things when we analyzed the data, it was like, oh my God, look, now what? So as you're going up the, uh, the x-axis, you're looking at increase in aflatoxin in the blood. And, and the, uh, on the left side, it's height for age. And on the right side, it's weight for age. As the blood aflatoxin goes up, the degree of faltering or growth faltering or stunting goes up a direct, strongly, highly significant linear effect. And subsequent studies have shown this over and over again. We're seeing a, a very direct effect on stunting in children. So as nutritionists, and those of you who are out here who are, in, who are nutritionists and are looking at the stunting effect in children, I just want you to know that there's a hidden factor in there, and uh, you will want to take it into account. Thank, Thank you very you. much. John? Good morning, everybody. Thanks to Mars for inviting me. Um, following on what Secretary Glickman said or suggested, I'm going to also tell a story, a little bit of how I get to know aflatoxin, how I'm involved in it, and why we think it's important that more people be involved in it. So you're not listening to an impartial panel here, as it might already be obvious. Uh, we are part of a nascent community of practice, uh, tentatively dubbed the Moldy Maze Society. So our little ask is for those of you who become committed after listening to the discussion, at least join the society. At the end of my little intervention, I'll have the big ask, but that's the little ask. I didn't even know about aflatoxin six years ago. I was the agribusiness team leader at the World Bank, having worked in agriculture 40 years, since 1971. During that period, I had been heavily involved in promoting agricultural exports from places like Central America, really all around the world, and had intermittent involvement with lots of food safety issues and animal health issues and plant health issues. So I knew a little bit about how to deal with food safety crises and, and uh, challenges. But I have to confess, I, if someone asked me in 2008 what well, aflatoxin, I said, I didn't know alfalfa had produced a toxin. So I would have been quite wrong. <laughs> <clears throat> 
But it came to me because uh, a representative of the Gates Foundation, who I think worked with you probably at the time, Arlene Mitchell came and said, hey, we got a problem. We're trying to build up the Purchase for Progress program in Kenya to improve the linkages of farmers to uh, World Food Program purchases locally. And we've now financed the purchase of an extremely large quantity, I think it was something like $2 million worth of, of maize that's all contaminated, or a larger amount of it is contaminated, and we don't know what to do with it. So can you form, help the bank contribute to the formation of a donor effort in this area, which Barbara's gonna talk about in detail. Based on that involvement, which came to me because I was representing the bank at this WTO Sanitary and Phytosanitary Committee, uh, as well as the Standards and Trade Development Facility, I didn't get the bank to really take action then, but when I came back to APT after the leave of absence that took me to the bank, I carried with me greater and greater concern about aflatoxin, and that's why I'm here as one of the proponents of a major effort. Now, Kitty has already talked, about, talked well and with sufficient detail, I think, about the presumed or known health effects and the nutritional effects. I'm going to amplify that and talk a little bit more about the agricultural effects and broaden it. Uh, Secretary Glickman mentioned in the morning about the issue of, of stove piping or, uh, that, that's always impeded conversations between ministries of health, agriculture, and when they exist, at least units of nutrition. That same thing exists internationally, but at least starting with the scaling up nutrition effort and other efforts such as attrition strategy from the bank, uh, that started to change. So in the international development field, the coming together of those fields is already well underway, maybe in a way more advanced in the developed countries. That is a happy prospect, but for those of us that come out of the only, the only the agricultural side, most of us do nothing about health, didn't think about nutrition a heck of a lot. We just wanted to help farmers make money by producing more crops, particularly high value crops for export. But as those fields have come together, our concern about this problem is, as a major impediment to achieving those concerns has is, is increased. And it turns out that aflatoxin is a major problem for agriculture. As mentioned, 42 crops are, are affected. That's the long list I've seen. It affects many of them from farm to fork, so a lot, almost all of them from farm to retailer. It affects fresh products, it affects processed products, it affects foods that's direct for human consumption. It goes into animal feed and fish feed. It affects the, uh, the raw material costs as well as the suitability of those, those products. And therefore it affects animals, it affects fish, it affects pets, it's a major problem with pets. It affects humans directly, and it has a huge impact on the value of agricultural product, the suitability to go to market, and is, is a major concern increasingly for agriculture. It was originally thought it was 15 degrees north and south of the equator was where the aspergillus tended to be found. Now it's up to 30, 35, and blipping up and down with climate change. So the, the degree of concern and the amount of countries involved and the amount of people affected is rising as time goes on, affected by climate change, but also the concern is rising as people become more aware of the multiplicity of effects. So if you have direct cause of liver cancer, comorbidity with hepatitis B, uh, presumed effect on uh, immune suppression, effect on gut health, which impedes the uptake of nutrients, you have suspected uh, increases in vulnerability to hepatitis B, to, to HIV AIDS, and to tuberculosis. And on top of that, an increasing number of people believe that there is a contributing linkage to stunting, if not a causal linkage. And it's, that it's one of the major uncounted factors. There's a lot to be worried about in ag, health, and nutrition. But because it also blocks borders, cuts off trade, it affected greatly the exports of peanuts, for instance, from Bolivia. Argentina, being more sophisticated and evolved, was able to deal with changes in, tox in, in tolerances in, in uh, European Union. But developing countries were not. And if you go to Nigeria now and you talk to producers of, of ground nuts, of peanuts, or you go to Malawi, they'll say that they lost the market in Europe because of aflatoxin. That's an exaggeration, but nevertheless, it's a concern. So this affects agriculture and trade. It affects agriculture, nutrition, and health and it affects economic growth through the problems of reduction in GDP that come from problems during the thousand days. So I would say the way, best way to look at this is picture three circles within an Olympic symbol. Three core circles are agriculture, and nutrition, health and nutrition. Right in the middle of that is food and water safety and right smack in the bullseye, in my view anyway, and many others is aflatoxin. Surrounding those are the other two circles. One is economic growth, the other is commerce and trade. So this is a major global problem that's underreported, underinvested, and needs to be helped. If you look at the statistics that went after a specific problem of great concern, which was HIV AIDS, more than, I think, $15 billion now have been raised to work on HIV AIDS. If you look at what happened in the case of avian influenza, because of the scare that'd be linked to pandemic human influenza, something like $2 billion has been raised. If you look at the amount that's gone officially for a single 
risk category. In this area, it's probably not even $100 million at this point. So funding is needed, political will is needed, and this is the time to act. Thank you. Barbara. Yes, my name is Barbara Stinson. I'm a senior partner at Meridian Institute, and I think you've given us a, a great graphic. I <laughs> challenge our graphic artists to capture the five, the five circles, but we'll, we'll do so before the end. Um, so I'm here today to talk a little bit about the start of a solution to this problem in Africa, on the continent of Africa, and uh, in the countries most affected in Africa. So, so far, with regard to the aflatoxin challenge, you've heard what a difficulty it is to manage this difficult toxin. We're going to now explore the, the pressing need for the sharing of experience and the partnerships that must be formed in order to really find solutions on this issue. And these are partnerships really at all levels. So we're I'm, I'm going to talk about Africa in particular, but know that uh, in the 35 degrees north to 35 degrees south or so, it's really 40 countries that are impacted. If we showed you a slide of highly impacted countries, though, you would see those in Southeast Asia, Guatemala significantly affected, uh, some South American countries, and the majority of the continent of Africa. Not all 54 countries, but virtually all of Sub-Saharan Africa. Aflatoxin affects the uh, entire continent in terms of health impacts, but really for people in all walks of life, particularly children, women, and the, vulnerable, the most vulnerable in the population, which is the majority of the population. You've already he heard about the well-established causal link of aflatoxin to the liver cancer, to liver disease, and the evidence that is accumulating, it's established in, in some form, but it's also accumulating further that it's associated with childhood stunting and the lifelong impacts to individuals, their brain effect, their brain function, and therefore to society and countries as a whole. I think I'll tell just a little bit of a story building on um, the, the challenge by Secretary Glickman about the, the particular difficulty that we see for women farmers in Africa. So also building on some of the comments that you offered, imagine smallholder farmers, primarily women, maybe less than a he hectare, trying to grow enough food just to feed her family. It might be uh, in part to sell a bit on, in a local trade market, uh, maize primarily, groundnut perhaps, uh, other, other commodities, and she goes to market with uh, a collection at the end of the month, and at that point, it's both good news and bad news, um, because there is, at least uh, uh, in some locations, some testing of aflatoxin. What she brings to the market may be rejected. So the, the good news is that it's not going actually into the mainstream food system, uh, from that point. The bad news is she's taking it home and feeding it to her children. Aflatoxin farmers' access to the international markets and is limited by aflatoxin uh, limits that are set internationally, that are set um, and internationally uh, across Africa differentially and uh, also to Europe and abroad. Efforts at creating a continental free trade area in Africa is accelerating and aflatoxin will be one of the substantial detriments to uh, free trade areas. Aflatoxin also greatly impacts food nutrition security across the continent. One example, uh, going back through history just a little bit, is in Kenya where many of the um, strongest outbreaks of aflatoxicosis, uh, infection from aflatoxin, one of the areas in where the outbreaks are maybe most recorded uh, are due to contaminated maize. In Kenya, in most years since 2001, you're going to see um, some record of outbreaks of aflatoxicosis in the population. In 2004, there were 331 cases and 125 immediate deaths, again, uh, primarily affecting the liver. 
This last outbreak uh, in 2004, there was another one in 2012. These outbreaks are the ones that really are receiving more serious attention and drawing attention to this issue. So we have a problem that kills people, causes stunting to children, and undermines economies. There is a clear moral reason and a social and economic imperative that forces us to deal with this problem head on. In Africa, the decision was made to specifically try to tackle this problem at the continental level. Aflatoxin, as a development challenge, is what we call a triple threat because it adversely affects three critical spheres that you've already heard about. Public health, trade and economies, economic development in countries, and food and nutrition security. In Africa, it's a particularly pervasive problem. Prevalence of high aflatoxin, as I said, in, well, at least 22 countries, but uh, particularly in 10 or more countries because the climatic conditions are conducive to its growth. As John said, it appears in the soil in the beginning, uh, in, in, as you plant seeds, it grows in the plant, it, it uh, increases its um, typically growth in plants as well, and then in storage, and with improper storage and handling, uh, it, it continues to grow and increase. Now this is a toxin that you can neither see and therefore you can't distinguish it from other fungus. You can't smell it, it's not distinguishable by smell, and you can't taste it. So you know you have fungus, but you don't know that it's aflatoxin contaminated. So due to the poor climatic conditions, the practices, traditional crop practices and post-harvest practices in Africa, limited diver uh, dietary diversity that we've already talked about, and the low levels of awareness of this problem it's a particularly acute problem in Africa. We're getting close to your five minutes. So the real solutions that we're uh, trying to establish in Africa have been uh, funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, the UK's Department of International Development and USAID. The Partnership for Aflatoxin Control was launched in 2012 with a vision to make Africa free from the harmful effects of aflatoxin. And you see a lot of material um, at your table with uh, more detail. In Africa, print material is so vital. And so we, we thought we'd bring you a few examples that the partnership has developed. PACA was born through the convening power of the African Union Commission to gather evidence and knowledge, share and disseminate that, to mobilize resources towards solutions and to provide a technical assistance program, a, st a strong technical assistance program. 14 member steering committee manages PACA and the organization supports regional economic communities and all countries across the, the continent in managing their aflatoxin. The effort is to establish a comprehensive policy regulatory program across the continent and in each most impacted country, particularly five countries that are uh, pilot countries, uh, among them Nigeria and others that have been uh, identified as, as really needing technical solutions. And there's a um, technology-based biocontrol that is uh, provided, that's being spread throughout the continent, but particularly in these five countries and other post-harvest technologies and strategies being advanced. PACA disseminates helpful information and uh, maintains a database of aflatoxin activities going on across the continent, um, but also really tries to bring together a partnership and platform of stakeholders from all over the continent to, to try to manage this problem. Thank you very much. Thus far, I think we, we have painted a fairly bleak picture of the scale and the complexity of something like this. And, and these toxins are witty. I mean, they're really smart. You know, they, they can live in the soil. They can colonize the plant. They have a good time in storage. And we need to really think now, and we'll ask some questions with quick answers, I hope, uh, so we can have some audience questions, too, before the end, about what, what is the future? For instance, I. I know that uh, you have worked on um, biocontrol. You've, you've talked about biocontrol. We had a 
we've tried biocontrol for a long time using uh, the material that you have uh, put out there, championed, and we've had tough luck with it as a user. And taking it to other places, we haven't had the kind of success. Are we at the point with the biocontrol where we can say it's sufficient, or do we really need to push it even harder to see if it has a wider range of conditionality? So when it rains, or when it's dry, when it's windy, whatever. What, what, what do you see as the real next stage of the aflatoxin? I mean, of the biocontrol, excuse me. Okay, so you know the biocontrol is using the same fungus, but it's uh, and it's naturally derived. It's not a GMO or anything. It's you you find the version of the fungus that doesn't make any toxin, and so you put that in the field in large quantities, and it displaces the toxic fun fungus. Where you get a good application, you can knock toxin production out almost 100 percent. It's be, it was developed by the USDA IRS here in the United States for cotton farmers in Arizona. It's being used in Texas very successfully. It's very profitable for them to use. And, the, and this technology is being replicated and has been taken to Africa. One of the problems in Africa is that they have to grow the fungus on something, so they're, they're growing the fungus on sorghum, which is also a food. It also increases the price. So we could use a good carrier for the, the biocontrol agent. And it isn't that the technology is a problem. It's the dissemination, because we have hundreds of millions of farmers that need to use it. And the technology has to have an incentive for people to do it. If there's no, if there's no benefit at the market for this, because nobody's talking about the fact that there's toxin or no toxin, if there's no benefit at the market, why would farmers use it? I mean, the reason it works here is because it's extremely important to them in terms of profits to not have aflatoxin. So we have a real incentive issue, and I think that's a bigger issue than the technology itself. The technology is, works and can be made to work. You have to apply each year, and over time, you'll have less and left, less of the toxic fungus in that soil. And that's what we want for Africa. We want to have less and less toxic uh, fungi. But to get that distributed to all the farmers in all of the at-risk countries is a massive undertaking. John, um, good agricultural practices. You've been involved with agriculture at the bank and post the bank. Is that sufficient to really push this? I mean, if you don't have Afligard because of the cost or that you're at the end of the road scenario, and many of these people who suffer the worst are at the end of the road where it's not simple to get these materials. Well, what do you think about just good agricultural practices? I think the general consensus is that good agricultural practices are always desirable in themselves. They vary a lot by circumstance, by commodity, by production system, so it's not a single set of practices. However, they are inexpensive. Uh, they're, they can be massively replicated. And to the extent they do have a positive effect on reducing the prevalence of aspergillus and or uh, the presence of aflatoxin at in the production stage or in storage and so on, they're all desirable. So I think there's an evolving set of people that think that because it's not, it may not be realistic to think of massive replication for all of Africa or all of the developing world that's subject to this of any particular biocontrol, no matter what wild funding scenario you have, maybe there should be a push towards sort of extended gap uh, that goes, not doesn't just end at the farm gate, but goes into post-harvest handling and even beyond, all the way to the first receiver, and that is massively replicated, but selected in a way that the, to make sure that the good agricultural practices that have an impact on aspergillus and aflatoxin are a part of it, and that, that the, the farmers would then adopt it based on, not because of its effect on aspergillus or on aflatoxin, but because it, it raises the quality and condition of their products and gives them a better place in the marketplace. So you, you selling and affect the aflatoxin, impeding effects through other benefits of adoption of good agricultural practices. Barbara, I, you said that uh, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation was your core funding with USAID and DFID. Is it enough? Is it, I mean, we all know the answer to that. No, it's not enough, of course. But where, where do you need, what are the dollars that you think are necessary to really make the impact that's needed? And we, you're talking about Africa. We could have Prabhu tell us a bit about India as an old school economist. And what, what, what is the dollar number? If you were to say, 
I can get rid of this problem in Africa, is it a billion dollars? I mean, we, there needs to be some understanding of this, what really has to happen. What is the cash input? Because I'm taken by the fact we've talked about economics, we've talked about trade, no one's talked about neurological development yet. And uh, I'd like to think there's many, many, many Einsteins in Africa. I'd like to think there's many, many Barbara McClintocks in Africa. But when I hear neurological development in stunting, it really worries me. So what, what's the dollars amount needed, do you think? I mean, you're part of PACA, so. I'll try to extrapolate up on that a little bit, but it's, it's, we want to be really clear, the stunting issue is not just a growth and development from a physical nature, it is brain development and cognitive development as well. And as I think we heard earlier today, you know, it's, if you don't hit it in those first two years of life, then you know, you've, the entire lifespan is affected. Um, so extrapolating up, to, from where we are now in terms of what kind of financial resources are really required to tackle this problem. Um, you know, we believe that the approach to managing aflatoxin in, in Africa is going to be one of a comprehensive approach that where countries have uh, regulatory schemes that they can enforce and testing and monitoring that can be done and uh, a, a, an array of materials, biocontrol materials available for the worst affected areas in the soil and storage and handling facilities and technology that can assist the farmer, um, uh, far farmers at all scales. So it's a comprehensive approach. You really have to cover all of that to manage aflatoxin. And doing it in five countries for a couple of years at a pilot scale and doing some continent-wide education and building of partnerships and all that is costing us $20 million. So $20 million is not going to do it. That's, that's a couple of years in five countries. Right, but, so but to scale that up to try to hit 22 countries in a comprehensive man manner over 20 years, I mean, so four it's times a, it's five, a, it's, it's a billion dollars probably. It is. I mean, it's a billion dollar it's, effort. It's a billion dollars. And that's just Africa. Because right. of the last, impacts in India and in last year, uh, or 2013, they brought in 60 billion dollars worth of food uh, materials for cash, no credit. This was all cash into Africa. 60 billion. One sixty of that could help solve the problem of the aflatoxin plague. And I'll call it a plague. W why don't we have the political will? to do that. I mean, I'm asking the question. I don't have the answer either. And then the next question is, we're not talking about the plants. We're talking about the soil. We're talking about the storage. How about host-induced gene silencing? How about gene editing? How about CRISPR? Where is this in the whole picture? So we'll start over here. Let's, let's answer that question. Where, where's modern science on the plant? We're still doing absolutely basic Mendelian genetics. The Mendelian genetics, just plain old plant breeding, has not worked. We've been, do, we've been doing it for 50 years and nobody's getting anywhere with it. Because it's complex, it's very hard to keep the fungus out. If you have one bite of one insect on one kernel, the fungus is in. So that just overcame whatever resistance you had. So that hasn't worked. What you're talking about, however, if, if you could block the toxin production, if the plant blocked the toxin production, all the aspergillus in the world could get in there and it wouldn't make any difference. It would not be toxic anymore. One RNAi and part of the aflatoxin production pathway and that would shut it down. So that'd be great. So why, that would be super. So why aren't we doing that, John? I mean, why isn't the World Bank, which is the biggest agricultural bank in the world, as you know, why aren't they saying, okay, let's get the five or six best Let's go out and get uh, Jennifer uh, Dudna, who was one of the inventors for CRISPR, say, let's buy your lab for three years and do this. Why don't we go to George Church at the Broad and say, let's buy your lab for three years. Both of you work on doing this. And let's only take the five biggest plants. We've got 40 plus plants. We'll get to that in a minute. But why isn't that happening? Tell me 
a good reason why that's not happening? Well, first of all, the bank doesn't directly finance uh, agricultural research of that sort. It finances part of the work under the consultative group for international ag research, as you know. Well, so they, the they yes, they have, they have influence over their use of money. Right. So in that sense, I guess they could move in that direction. The bigger problem is when there are so many uh, crises to be concerned about, whether it's the food price volatility or... Uh, or climate change and so on, there are a lot of, there's a little bit of uh, fatigue with the number of things to work on, first of all, to be blunt. Second of all is ministers of finance don't come to the bank or other international organizations and ask for loans for food safety unless they're going to try to get accession to Europe, which occurred in the case of Turkey, for instance, to, to, to EU. So if nobody's asking you for the money, then you, you can, who do you lend it to? Third one is there's a Rel there's still some stove piping and differences of opinion between the health community, the nutrition community, and the ag community as to the relative importance of this and where the money should go. The health community is still focused on the communicable diseases and less so on now non-communicable diseases. They don't quite believe what we're saying about stunting. The nutritional community was actually, I'd say, in all honesty, not too, it, not too believing of this as well. It's starting to come around. The ag community is more concerned. So there's uneven sense of commitment among the three main pillars, health, agriculture, and nutrition. And that has an effect on where decisions go. Another factor is, is the absence of a clear uh, roadmap. So maybe it's extended gap in which biocontrols would play a role that can be done massively for a large number of people. But they want, what's, what's the, uh, the solution that can be done on a large scale at a reasonable price that we can have prospects of, of market sensitive change that will be picked up by the farmers and will take off on its own? That's what they're looking for. Well, I'm here to tell you, it is modern technology. It is CRISPR. Yeah. It is host-induced gene silencing. I mean, we know that works. So, I mean, we somehow have to get a community like that's in this audience to say, we're going to stand up for this. And by damned it, you know, we have one of the future uh, owners of Mars Incorporated here. Let's get together as industry. If all these other people won't do it, I mean, this is the future. This is a billion people in Africa. It's 4.5 billion people suffer from aflatoxin or related problems. It just seems uncanny that the ministers aren't asking for help. I mean, what, what hole do they have their head in? But before we an you answer that question, Barbara, I mean. I'll answer that question too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I, I, how many industrial private industries do you have working with you in PACA on, on modern plant breeding at this point? Not, none at all on modern plant breeding, although I would say, you know, the CIMIT and other uh, CG they're, agencies. They're not modern plant breeding. <laughs> no, I mean, really, that's yeah. not, there's, it's not their goal. It's not even one of their charges. Yeah. The industry representatives that are working with PACA that are most invested in making a change in this are agribusness uh, entities on the continent. Of seed and things of that nature. Yes, and, and some interest in, in Mars and some, some other food companies, global food companies. So the, the private sector engagement is key for the next period. Um, with regard to the political will, each individual country faces food, literally food stocks, uh, food, uh, stockpiles of maize and other products that are contaminated with aflatoxin that they cannot deal with now. They can't feed it to their population and they can't burn it. They can't uh, destroy it in any manner. And I mean, that, so the, telling the story of aflatoxin, as John says, without the solutions, either uh, being put in place or already well on their way is going to be is very challenging in in all the countries that we're already working in i just want to ask you a question real quick what about mother's milk oh no no, no, no. let's not go there why not it's a, it's a <laughs> there's a, there's an important point though that i want to follow on okay just make before, that before point, oh, okay i'll, I'll and come then back give to me a milk. short answer to the mother's but the, milk. the the industries that are the aggregate businesses that are helping uh in africa are the ones that want to buy clean product and so they're creating that incentive that I was talking about for growers to change their practices. They make it worthwhile. So if Nestle or Mars or, or whoever is there wanting to buy clean maize, then that starts kickstarting and creating the market demand, which is what we need to, to get the farmers engaged to do what they need to do. So let me challenge you on that just for a second. <laughs> Oh, good. I got away from the mother's milk. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't forgotten. I got a, I got a little star by it right uh -huh. there. 
but that's fine. Mars and Nestle and other Unilever yeah. will buy some stuff. But that has no effect on the rural sector. Yeah. You're talking about industrial farmers in South Africa, Nigeria, Tanzania. You're talking about big farms, 500, 1,000 hectares. Correct. You so, start somewhere. So, so the other, I, I mean, it, 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 you start somewhere. Here's, but, but here's what happens. If, if, if a farmer is growing that be, and, and producing it, let's say, using the biocontrol agent, then whatever he, keeps, he or she keeps back is also clean. And the biocontrol agent spreads from that field into the neighboring fields of that village as well. So you create that draw. If you can create that demand, then you can, then you can start pulling the technologies that the growers so, are going so to do. So let me ask you do. a question with biocontrol. So big, big companies, please come along, buy, make, make the market demand. But we had trouble with it in rainy seasons. And, and mm -hmm. it, it, it honestly, uh, we could have John Pitt here from CSIRO who ran the stuff. He had, a, he had a different formulation. No, no, you know, no, no. We, he we, didn't we, formulate he, it. In we the looked same way. at Affligard. Yeah. Really. But in the rains, it became very problematic. We lost the, the impact. Mm -hmm. And the Aspergillus flavus came back like a lightning rod and reinfected the field. Is there still a very narrow functionality to this biocontrol that we need to fix so it works in a more myriad of conditions versus a narrow set of conditions? Yes. Thank you. <laughs> John, next question. No point in arguing with you. Right. I, I, I mean, I'm just... There, certainly the technology we, can we, be We can need be to fix upon. the plants. We need to yeah. fix the biocontrol to be more efficacious across a larger group of climatic conditions, which are now, everyone in this room knows that Africa is going through this like this. It rains in the wrong season, you put the Afligar down, and then it rains again uncannily when it was supposed to be dry. So I'm not criticizing, don't get me wrong. I'm just, I'm just trying to get where science can help you. And if science can help, then we need to manifest what is in this room energetically towards that. John, another question. I see. I, I dropped the mother's milk one for you. John, I mean, you, you, you sat around uh, the bank a long time doing these great projects. I mean, who do you have to go to? Do you, do you need to go to the Norwegians and say, this is a problem. You've got a big pile of money. Give me a billion dollars. I'll solve this. Where, where are you going to get the dough? <laughs> We, we didn't get sufficient ground traction within the bank itself in the face of the food price crisis, the global food safety, I'm sorry, the uh, GFSI, the, uh, which led to gas, the global food safety uh, uh, initiative, and then the global agriculture and food support program and so on. There were a lot of things going on. And while I was there before I retired, it wasn't sufficient time, but we, we did get going. Uh, the bank for the first time signed a memorandum of understanding with APEC on its food safety cooperation form. Which, and when you're talking about APEC, you're talking about basically half of the population of the world and half of the food consumption in the world. So we got half the world in principle agreeing to work together on food safety. After I left, my successors uh, built it up into an all-globe thing, so it became the Global Food Safety Partnership. We tried to get aflatoxin in as, as one of the early planks, ran into a problem in that in the food safety world, there are quite a few people that believe in a systems approach, saying that we have multiple risk categories to worry about. Aflatoxin and mycotoxins are just one out of 20 that we need to worry about. Therefore, we have to concentrate on systems upgrading. We shouldn't concentrate on a single risk category. There are other of us, myself included, that were saying, no, if you really want to solve the systems problem, you've got to concentrate on something that hurts enough people of developing in developed countries, a large enough population to gather attention and use that to, to fix the system. And that's the argument that continues to this day. I think that winning that argument is the beginning to what you're saying, and the solutions should include what you, the, the scientific ones that you're mentioning, the research ones, but also very simple things. Don't dry in the ground, put it up on a tarp. Uh, use moisture testing to figure out whether you're at the right temperature, the right moisture level for maize. Uh, do sorting in ground nuts because sorting is a relatively effective method in ground, in ground nuts. So sorting, sampling, laboratory, a whole panorama of very simple low-tech solutions have to be promulgated massively. At the same time, uh, thrust goes underway in the directions you're talking about. I think you need all of that together. We're down to about 10 minutes. So I, I, I thought we were going to ask a few questions from the audience. Because, and I see the first question right here. David. 
So normally, when we have a catastrophe of this magnitude, we do want to eradicate the source. But the first thing we usually do is create a vaccine and try to get it to as many people as possible while we work on eradicating the source. Has any effort been made to develop a vaccine for this? I noticed, I, I just, while you were talking, searched online and found an Italian study, sorry, Frank, uh, on uh, vaccinating and, and uh, anaphylatoxin B1 vaccination of dairy cows that prevented communication of the anaphylatoxin. It's a 2011 paper, looked at 5,000 times, cited four times, so obviously it's not widely read. Uh, but I, I just wonder, what are your reactions to that? Why not? The emergent event is developing children being exposed to permanent damage to the liver, the brain, etc. Why not go immediately to that, get them vaccinated while you work on the solution regarding the crop? So, so would you not suggest, David, that maybe a year or two years before a young woman is pregnant, you would start the vaccination of the mother, since there is transference through mother's milk? Okay. Nothing aside, just, you know, forgive me if I don't give a really proper answer, but just generally. Okay, we're talking about aflatoxin, not the aspergillus. You're not vaccinating against a, I've never heard of a vaccination against a chemical as such. Against it's not, a toxin. It's not a living organism, it's a chemical. Okay, so the aspergillus is a causal organism, so I'm not sure what you're vaccinating. No, I think what, what that reference was was probably a way to uh, mitigate the impacts of aflatoxin M1 in milk it, because that's a concern for the, for the dairy industry. So it may, may have been to nullify that effect. There is efforts underway uh, using uh, clays, Novaseal is one of them, to mitigate the nutritional impact in animals. And it's, it's, it's generally recognized as safe. It, it is being used uh, significantly in the animal feed industry to counteract the nutritional uptake problems that aflatoxin causes once it's contaminated. But it isn't against the aflatoxin as such, it's, it's to nullify the nutritional impact. Right. But, so anyway, yeah, sorry. I mean, we still have to get a few more questions. <clears throat> yes, ma'am. How do you get to the people, because Africa has 54 countries, and just looking at the countries you have, how could the other countries be reached to fight the Aflex, as you say, because the victims, 80% of the victims are in the rural areas who are infected, and you're just talking about a few countries. You need to work with the local organizations and like us who know the culture, the tradition, and translating into the language that they can hear so that they can know this is, this is a, a serious thing and this is a problem because they don't know. The government doesn't care. The government they will eat good food, but the people affected are the ones in the rural areas. How how do you get to them? You need to work with people like us and the other organizations of the ground who know their tradition and culture for the outreach to let the people know. Thank you. So how do we work together to make that happen? Okay. More of a statement than a question, but we'll answer it anyway. So I, I do, I, this is a, such an important question. I used to think that we had to tell everybody, and I actually did a couple of campaigns in West Africa where we told the population and then tested to see what would happen. Bad idea. The people in the United States don't know about aflatoxin. And the mothers in the villages in Africa don't need to know about it either. It's a complex scientific topic. What I suggest and what we're working towards and thinking about is using, Africa is having larger and larger urban populations as well. And those are aggregating points of information and aggregating points of where people buy food. If we can create a differential awareness of food quality starting there, then that demand is going to go out to the countryside where the food is being produced. So it's an extremely important question. I think that, that we, we would start not at the poorest of the poor and not at those who are at the farthest end of the road. We start where the most people are in the first place. And I would just add, that is essentially what we're doing with the Partnership for Aflatoxin Control in Africa in these five countries. But really, I have to disagree just slightly because we're also going out to rural areas and part of the country plans that are being developed by agriculture, health, and trade, all three ministries together, is, uh, includes an education program and testing equipment and materials out to the local level. So we've got to have the education and the solution at the same time at the local level, but you really have to do it from the top down and the bottom up. 
Okay. We have a question back here. Hello, I'm uh, Philip de Leon with Echo Corporation GSI. Uh, GSI is a large U.S. manufacturer of grain storage solution. So we talked a lot about the issues. I'd like to talk about some of the solutions and partnership between the public and private sector. Uh, we do grain storage, you can see in the Midwest, but we're also working to install small storage in rural areas in Africa. We have a collaboration between FinTrack USAID in Zambia and an organization called Musica. We're looking at perishable goods as well. So I just want to extend a hand to you and say, let's talk because maybe we are part of the solution. We don't have all the solution, but we're trying to bring scalable solutions to the small farmers uh, we're trying to bring some things that is affordable. So I just want you to be aware of it because I hear a lot of uh, discussion about uh, the issue, but what about the solution? Well, our company has part of the solution and we work with different organizations like CNFA to bring them to underground. So I wanted to bring that to your attention. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We want your card at the end of the presentation. Other questions? All right, I want to give everybody one minute. Okay. We'll start with Barbara. Anything I want. <laughs> well, I think in closing I would just say, uh, here you've heard that here in the United States, aflatoxin is not that well known, but in certain agricultural and scientific communities it's well known. The solutions are also well known. In Africa, the in the last three years, aflatoxin has become uh, much better understood <laughs> by the leading top echelons of the scientific community, research institutions, and heads of governments as well as top, top ministerial level, uh, and, and leaders of organizations, NGOs and companies. So the education process is starting, the understanding is starting, and the solutions are, uh, as he points out in storage, the solutions really do uh, they're available and transferable to Africa in each of the major areas that we've talked about, from regulation down to, and that's more than a minute. Yes, it is. So. <laughs> Please, John. Uh, as I said before, this is a very, very serious problem whose dimensions are only now becoming clear. We're now at the intersect of science and public policy. We're not yet at the intersect of science, public policy, and public finances. There's an issue of willingness and ability to pay on the part of who, who is hurt versus who should be concerned. So given that a lot of the uh, effects, the health and nutritional effects occur long, over a long period of time, individuals when faced with, do I either eat this contaminated food, even if I know it's contaminated or of low quality, or do I starve, are going to eat the food. So you need a public policy intervention that recognizes that in the long run it's in the country's interest and the society's interest, and particularly in the interest of the vulnerable women, children, and uh, even unborn infants to, to be helped because it's, it's affecting their long-term development individually as, as communities and in the country. But to do that, we need you who are thought and practice leaders in each of your respective fields to seek out more information, to take action. Take it, picture it as a kaleidoscope. If you're in the health field, turn it to health and figure out what you want to do. If you're in the gender field, turn it to gender and figure out what you concerns about. And we're, we're happy to try to provide the information on what's the, why should it matter to you and what can you do about it and tailor it to your particular interests. So we want action segmented by the areas in which you, you have influence. Okay, perfect. This is a problem that starts in the field, in the production field, it goes through commerce, and the impacts are in human health, which is why it has stayed so obscure, because that's really in the gap between human health and agriculture. We've talked a lot about agriculture this morning. I want to talk to the, the, the public health people here now. I did an analysis that showed if you added up liver cancer, perinatal mortality, if you just cut a third of the perinatal mortality, and if you just cut a third of the stunting, disease and, and dailies lost would be greater from aflatoxin-mediated disease than malaria or tuberculosis. But you don't see it that way because it's this, this amalgamation of impacts. You don't see it as one thing. Malaria gets much more interest out of the public health community than this does, but it's because it's not seen. 
So I think that I, I would appeal, I think that the public health sector hasn't been as engaged as I would like for them to be, and that's why we're talking here today. I think. Uh, I'll make the last few comments. I want to really thank Kitty John and Barbara for bringing this out. It, it, it's such a, a, a horrible discussion. I mean, really, when I say that, it's one of these wake-up calls that you can't go to sleep tonight thinking, well, everything's pretty good, you know, and a nice day at the meeting, the future of food. You need to go to sleep tonight going, boy, aflatoxin really is horrible. Aflatoxin is a plague on humanity. I can't, I don't know what other words to use to describe it. Every other plague, we invest hundreds of millions of dollars, billions of dollars. And this one, for some reason, seems to sort of fall between the cracks. And I would encourage this group and those of us in industry to try to get together at the next level. I actually think plant science it could be a profound way to solve some of these problems. Not all of them, no question. Storage is always going to be an issue, too. But I think the technology, if we're looking at Moore's Law, which is 50 years old, what has happened in the last three or four years makes going after these solutions tactable from a plant science perspective. Being a gene jockey, that's what I think about a lot. And uh, I would encourage all of you out there to go back to where you go to and say, you know, I just heard about aflatoxin, well, what are we going to do about it? And by raising that awareness between us all, we will solve this problem in these countries around the world that suffer immeasurably because of this plague. I want to thank you very much. It's, it's great to see you all again. I want to thank the organizers for giving this opportunity. Thank you.